My name is Phil Leto, and I'd like to welcome you to this session of Leto Lectures, where we are completing or continuing our year-long look at the race for the presidency in 2020, sort of making the turn and heading to the home stretch toward Election Day, November the 3rd, about 60 or so days from now. When we last met and talked about the great American healthcare um, conundrum, we began our discussion by taking a look at the state of the race as it then stood uh, between President Donald Trump and the Democratic nominee, former Vice President Joe Biden. At that time, we were still waiting for one of the big question marks regarding the nature of the race to be um, answered. And of course, since we've last met, we've seen Joe Biden select California Senator Kamala Harris as his running mate. Kamala Harris, the senator from California, uh, breaking several barriers, setting several records, if that's the right word, becoming the first woman of color to be nominated by a major party um, to serve as its vice presidential candidate. Kamala Harris's father was born in Trinidad and immigrated to study in the United States, um, at which time he met Kamala Harris's mother, who came from Asia, from India, and um, with their marriage and their offspring, uh, they've produced in Kamala Harris a woman of a pretty wide um, um, ethnic um, breadth, and again, record-setting, the first African-American um, candidate on a major party ticket, and also the first candidate of Asian heritage to be included uh, to run for president. So we now stand today, or at least I do, as the Democrats are conducting their convention. Um, the time involved in filming this and editing it and then mailing it off to each of your communities, um, unfortunately does not give us the immediacy of speaking in, in real time like we normally would do when we made these presentations live, but we've seen several days of what clearly is the most unconventional presidential convention to have taken place perhaps in our lifetimes, or at least in a very long time, as we've, as we've watched via television, by video feeds, by Zoom, by using multiple venues, remember not Milwaukee, that was originally going to host the convention to sort of do the things that presidential nominating conventions do. Uh, the Democrats trying to show the depth and the breadth and the reach of the party. If you are the out of office party, a lot of the convention is dedicated to pointing out the deficiencies and the flaws of the incumbent. Um, we've seen, of course, already speeches from Michelle Obama. We've seen Joe Biden's um, um, wife um, speak. We have not yet heard from Kamala Harris nor the nominee Joe Biden himself, who's probably going to either be in his basement or in some other remote location when he accepts the Democratic nomination. And um, the metaphorical balloons begin to drop and all the hooting and hollering takes place um, as the convention comes to an end. Now, what typically occurs is as conventions end, pollsters furiously begin to gauge um, how the public looks at the candidates after one of the parties has held its convention. And it's not unusual, once a convention ends, for the candidate who was just nominated to get a bounce, a bump in the polls, as much of the nation, being optimistic, has spent some time at least looking or reading about um, what the party's done for the next few days. Now next, of course, we're going to see attention turn to President Trump and to the Republican convention.
how are they going to present most of the convention's business from remote locations? How are they going to use video feeds? How are they going to use Zoom? Are there going to be any surprise speakers, any surprise announcements? Uh, President Trump has stated publicly very recently that he's been very satisfied with Mike Pence as vice president. Mike is with, is with him to the end, but there's still a week or so to go, and that certainly would be one of the great curveballs, one of the great um, 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 acts that Donald Trump could perform if he believes that this race really needs to be shaken up. Not a probability, but just something to think about. Um, through the Republican convention, we're going to hear from notable Republican rising stars, both office holders and aspiring office holders from all around the country. Again, the Republicans trying to show their diversity and their reach and present their platform to the American people. We know that um, at the end of the convention, President Trump is going to deliver his acceptance speech live, um, I think, from the grounds of the White House, after which there is going to be a, a firework presentation in Washington, D.C. And then once that convention ends, the pollsters once again will go out begin surveying people who, again, either watched some of, followed, or heard that Republican convention, and see whether or not the president will receive a post-convention bounce, which ordinarily happens um, in, in recent American presidential politics. Once the bounce has been recognized, and once the dust settles, probably a week or so later, right as we enter Labor Day weekend, then we actually will begin what is considered to be the general election phase of the run for President of the United States. So a process that began last summer, in the summer of 2019, when all kinds of Democrats began debating among and between themselves who would make the best opponent to President Trump. After we began in January and February, a normal cycle of caucuses and primaries, only to have that great interloper, COVID-19, um, throw a monkey wrench into the operations. Many states postponing their primaries, some canceling their caucuses. And we saw, of course, people afraid to go out and stand in line and vote at a precinct like they might have normally done, rely on mail-in voting. In some cases, in states that have long used mail-in voting in election time, but in other cases, states having to very quickly and very rapidly create some mechanism for vote by mail to be utilized. I suspect we're going to hear a lot about that and a lot of the differences between absentee voting and mail-in voting and the legitimacy of votes um, in the days and weeks to come. So the stage is set now for both candidates to make their dash towards those undecided voters in states that are up for grabs in order by November the 3rd, probably actually sometime after November the 3rd, to be declared the winner in enough states so that one of them will have won the magic number of 270 electoral votes and thus claim the mantle of presumptive president-elect of the United States. So we've got a lot of activity and a lot of action um, still before us. Um, I'm an optimist and I hope that maybe even by the end of the year we'll actually be able to gather one, maybe two times 
once again in some live forum to talk more immediately and more in the present tense about where the race lies. But until then, we're going to work as hard as we can to keep the lectures as timely and as close to the action as, as possible, given the new um, scenario we've used um, to present our topics. Now, the United States, of course, has a unique system that we use to select our president. And perhaps it was forever doomed to confusion or greater confusion by the name that the framers of our Constitution gave this process, the Electoral College. Um, back when I actually taught at universities and, and taught college classes, if I was teaching an introductory government class, I would usually give in the first or second um, day of classes a questionnaire to students, not to be graded, but just to get an idea uh, of where they stood regarding certain aspects of American government. Um, frequently, I would ask true or false questions. One of them I often asked was true or false. The um, Electoral College is located on the banks of the Mississippi River in St. Louis, Missouri. And to my great surprise and disappointment, you'd be amazed how many trues I received in, in so answering. So this great um, system, the Electoral College system, is one that we are going to talk about today. Hopefully each of you have or will soon receive a handout which is going to contain maps, it's going to contain charts, it's going to contain um, some text talking about how the system was created and, and how it works. But I hope that by the time this presentation is over, we will all be electoral college experts. We will understand the nuances and the vagaries uh, and the peculiarities of a system, again, that was essentially created in 1787 um, when delegates from 12 of 13 states gathered in Philadelphia to write the Constitution of the United States. So we know today that every state has a certain number of electoral votes. Our goal today is, try, is to try to understand how these numbers get up here and why each state has, in many cases, different numbers of electoral votes and why in the world in 2020 are we going to elect our president by using this state by state by state system and not just count up all the votes cast nationwide and give the presidency to the candidate that wins the national uh, popular vote. We know we don't use the national popular vote to elect our president. And we know that in a number of elections, in 1824, in 1876, um, in 2000, and just four years ago, in 2016, the candidate that won the most votes cast from all the states that were eligible, eligible to vote in those years did not win the presidency because his or her opponent won the most electoral votes. The system again used to select the president of the United States. So in order to better understand these numbers and why this system evolved, it's important again to take a step back and to build a bit of a foundation to provide a little context to what happened when 13 states attempted to form, quote, a more perfect union by creating and then eventually ratifying 
a constitution for the United States of America. Now, the short version of this, of course, involves by 1787, the United States, which just four years before had won independence from British control, the British signing the Treaty of Paris in 1783, recognizing the sovereignty of the United States, four years later, by 1787, were dealing with a whole host of challenges regarding the admission of new states into the Union, regarding the raising of an army and a navy to protect this young country from the rapacious intentions, perhaps, of the British or the French or the Spanish that might seek to invade us. There was a need to create a national government. There was the need to create a national mechanism that, if nothing else, would be better able to do one thing on behalf of, at the time, 13 states, than each individual state trying to do these things itself. A predecessor document that had been ratified in the late 1770s, the Articles of Confederation, it was called, was the first attempt to form a national government in a time of war, the Revolutionary War, that could act on behalf of all of the states, but just four years into our country's independence, those articles were found to be woefully deficient. Thus the need to go back to the drawing board and attempt to create a new mechanism to create a national government that could do certain things, but essentially not one that would be able to overwhelm and take away from individual states the right in their own legislatures to deal with most of the pressing problems that at that time were considered to be local state matters. So the Great Convention began to gather in May of 1787. The gathering was somewhat surreptitious. Many fearful that if citizens of the states heard what was taking place, they might believe that there somehow was some subversive gathering that might eventually seek to take away not only the autonomy of the state, but the hard-fought rights of the individual citizens. You know, the propositions, all men were created equal, endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights, among them life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. At this convention, 12 of 13 states, Rhode Island elected not to send a delegation to take part in the writing of the Constitution. Rhode Island, a small state with a small population, was very suspicious of what larger states like Virginia, Pennsylvania, New York, Massachusetts might leave with compared to some of the lesser populated states. So 12 of them sent delegates to Philadelphia. Eventually, 56 men, and, and they all were men, um, would take part in all or part of or sometimes commute back and forth to come in and out of this gathering to write what on September the 17th, 1787, when it was completed, was presented to the United States, to the American states, as a new constitution of the United States of America. There were all kinds of concerns on the minds of uh, delegates to the Constitutional Convention. Lots of it, of course, having to do with power and lots of it having to do with a recognition, a, a reality that many believed, as given the case of the British king 
and the actions of the British Parliament, that absolute power not only corrupted absolutely, but that absolute power was often a means for an authoritarian type of government to be imposed on people who were hopefully going to begin the modern world's first experiment into self-government. So lots of wary delegates began to make their way into Philadelphia. And I think it's fair to say at a time where we sometimes get the impression that being well-educated and well-read and well-traveled and, and smart is not sometimes an ideal attribute for someone holding elective office. The delegates to this convention constituted some of the best educated, some of the best read, some of the best traveled, some of the smartest, and yes, some of the wealthiest residents of the states involved. And it would be up to them to try to find a proper balance between powers that were going to be given to the national government. We call our national government, of course, today the federal government, and all the other powers that the framers believe were going to be left to the states and to the states alone. Probably the most important participant at the Constitutional Convention was a delegate from the state of Virginia by the name of James Madison. He would go on to become America's fourth president, who'd done a lot of thinking about the system he would like to see created and had actually come to Philadelphia armed with a blueprint, an idea that might be a starting point in creating new government that very unimaginatively, I guess, came to be known as the Virginia Plan. The Virginia Plan was one which saw the way in which to deal with the great fear of giving too much power to too few through the separation of powers in several different ways. Madison's blueprint, for instance, would create the template that we know today is responsible for our national government being one composed of three branches, an unelected, and, and for our purposes today, um, um, less important at this time, judicial branch, but more importantly, two elected branches of government. An executive who would have all kinds of, of duties. Eventually, he'd be called the president. Uh, Madison's original plan had called for there to be a three-person presidency, sort of like the old Roman triumvirates. That obviously didn't make it to, to the final stage. One could only imagine today three presidents with three Twitter accounts and all the confusion that might have caused. But the executive, the president, was viewed again as a very critical and the most powerful single individual in this system. And then, of course, Madison conceived of the creation of a lawmaking branch or a legislative branch. In his mind, these branches would have powers unique to each one individually, but the way the powers were distributed, it would be often difficult for any one branch to act unilaterally because of the checks that in important matters would make it difficult for one branch to act on its own because the other branches, like the federal courts these days, would have the ability to find unconstitutional 
the actions of the other branches, or in the interplay between the two elected branches, the legislative branch, our Congress, and of course our executive, the president, the Constitution envisioned all kinds of checks and balances that again would make it difficult in many matters for either of these um, entities to act unilaterally. That of course is the great separation of power that, that we recognized and probably studied in schools as being one of the great beautiful novel ideas um, in, in the writing of the Constitution. Now, there was a more subtle and, and an equally important separation that was contemplating in, in writing the Constitution, and that was the idea that the national government that was being created by the people in the Constitution was going to have limited, enumerated, defined powers. So, in many ways, I like to analogize the Constitutional Convention to a meeting where every state arrived with a bag containing every conceivable power that any government could possess. And if you think about it, if our early founding fathers didn't get along with each other, and if the Constitutional Convention was a bust, there might have indeed emerged 13 separate sovereign national entities, countries, that would have all the powers in their bags available to their legislature to act on and act on alone. So writing the Constitution was a process in which a federal system of governing was created. A federal system meaning one where this national government, this federal government, shared power with the governments of the individual states and the residents of those states, the people in we the people, who essentially went through a process where the delegates in empowering the federal government said, okay, the power to raise and support an army and a navy. Each of us are going to take this hypothetical power out of our bags and bam, we're going to give it to the national government. The power to create a postal system. We'll talk more about that later. Um, again, better that there be one than 13 separate ones. To mint um, coins and print money, better one common currency than 13 in order to um, stimulate um, commerce among and between the states. Um, how about this one? Um, the power to declare war. What about if, you know, Georgia went off and declared war on some state, on some country, and all the other states refused to do so? That was a power, of course, given eventually um, to Congress. So many of these powers, the power to establish one common system for immigration and naturalization, rather than each state setting their own standards, were again extremely logical powers to give to the national government. So there came a point when all the giving of powers, all of the breathing of life into the federal government, the national government, had come to an end, and when that did come to an end, all of the powers that remained in each of the bags of each of the state delegations were powers that were retained by the states and thus able to be dealt with 
differently by individual state legislatures located in state capitals all across the country. One of the great hallmarks of our constitutional um, writing was the creation of this federal system. So we recognize today that there are enormous areas of law that are still left to the states and the states alone. Most criminal law development and prosecution, 99% perhaps, involve violation of state criminal statutes. Thank God, the marriage, the laws of marriage, divorce, child support, custody, alimony, state by state by state determinations. Some quite different from another. There are no federal matrimonial laws. The laws of wills and trusts and estates. Who gets what when someone dies intestate without a will is quite different from one state to another. So again, this is maybe more subtle, but this again was in the eyes of the framers one of the great ways to protect against a consolidation of power in the hands of too few. The word tyranny was a word, of course, that during our revolutionary period, in the Declaration of Independence, during the Revolutionary War, was one used quite frequently to describe the actions of the British king and often of the British Parliament. Someone possessing complete power and using it in a way that was arbitrary and destructive of those unable to resist the use of this power against them. So in writing the Constitution, one of the big subtexts was, how do we write a document that does not enable anyone who occupies these positions, or for that matter, any state, to amass so much power that they might be able, in the short term or the long term, to impose an American-made tyranny on America's citizenry. So at the federal level, in theory, checks and balances and separations of powers have prevented you know, the Supreme Court, presidents, houses of Congress from amassing so much power to themselves that they've become tyrants intimidating and overwhelming the intentions of others, we've seen in American history, particularly in, in times of war, Abraham Lincoln um, during the Civil War, Theodore Roosevelt during his nearly eight years as president, FDR during the Great Depression and World War II, Lyndon Johnson, um, Ronald Reagan, maybe Donald Trump today, try to very forcefully expand and test the limits of presidential power, finding, of course, the judiciary at times, or at other times, Congress, checking you know, guardrails against what might be, I think, quite honestly, a natural impulse of a president to again test the limits of his power. And, and for whatever it's worth, the Constitution created some pretty um, significant checks on presidential power in domestic matters. But the Constitution as written, and then throughout our history, has given the president a much freer hand in unilaterally conducting foreign policy and once, of course, Congress has declared war, the president is the person responsible for going out and persecuting it, prosecuting it, winning it on behalf of, of the United States. So we see this system. 
Much of it, again, was in Madison's original Virginia plan, but it would undergo significant change throughout this process. One, perhaps, critical change was Madison's Virginia plan envisioned a one-house unicameral legislature where each state would send a certain number of representatives to make laws at the federal level, the national level, in the United States. As Virginia was then the most populous state in the Union, the Virginia plan envisioned more populous states receiving more seats in this legislature than less populous states. So because the framers had determined early on in their meetings that whatever they were able to write, and hopefully they'd be able to finish something, for it to become the supreme law of the land, it would have to be sub submitted to the people, the citizens of the states, their representative actually, state legislatures, and undergo a ratification process. And unless the Constitution stated, nine states voted to ratify it. Nine out of 13 in total. Nine out of the 12 that participated in writing the Constitution, 75% voted to ratify the Constitution would not become the supreme law of the land. Nine states, a very high bar. So one of the first critical disputes that occurred came when this Virginia plan and this one house Congress was highly disfavored by states that had lesser populations, in some cases much smaller populations than the large states at the time. States like Delaware, Connecticut, New Jersey, Georgia, very much feared how their citizens might fare if only one legislative body based on population um, was created. If you look at those five states, you know, and, sub and subtract 13 minus 5, that got you 8, not enough to ratify. So a delegate from New Jersey by the name of Livingston um, came forward with the so-called New Jersey plan. It didn't involve bribery or, or burying bodies in the... Um, swamps outside of, of Newark or, or anything like that, the Meadowlands, but it held that because each state, in theory, again, if everything went um, foul, were potentially equally sovereign entities. Again, each state had all of its powers in its own bag, Population didn't matter because notwithstanding the population, notwithstanding the area, every state would be a sovereign entity equal to each other. So the New Jersey plan suggested every state have the same number of seats. Population did not count. The New Jersey plan also emphasized the fact that states were sovereign entities and would still have much power within the construct of the federal system that was being created. So states as an entity should have a greater seat at the table when national policy was being created. So it took a delegate from uh, Connecticut by the name of Roger Sherman to come along and produce what became known as the Great Compromise. 
a suggestion, which some had already been thinking about, of there being a two-house or a bicameral legislature, it eventually would become our Congress, and it would consist of two houses, a House of Representatives and, of course, a United States Senate. Under this great compromise, members of the House were going to be directly elected to represent a, const a congressional district. The Constitution stated that each district should have no more than 30,000 residents living um, um, within it. Um, the Constitution has really never been um, amended otherwise, but there are now approximately um, 600,000 individuals living in each congressional district. So always from the beginning, the House of Representatives was indeed the people's house because from the beginning, members were directly elected by those living in House districts. They would go every two years, um, stand for re-election, and if they won, they would immediately be able to take the interests of those whom they lived among to the nation's capital to be discussed um, in Congress. Congress was given the right, through the legislative process, bill signed by the president, to establish how many seats there would be in the House of Representatives. And it changed in the early years of our country's history throughout the, the 19th century. But in 1910, Congress established the number 430 five seats in the House of Representatives at a time, of course, prior to Arizona, New Mexico, Alaska, and Hawaii becoming states. And in 1929, um, when Congress sent to President um, Herbert Hoover the Permanent Reapportionment Act of 1929, that number 435 was set more in stone. Now, in 1959, the United States admitted two new states in, into the Union, the final two, Alaska and Hawaii. And for the next two years, until the reapportionment that followed the 1960 census, Congress temporarily added two seats to the House, one temporarily for Hawaii, one temporarily for Alaska. But after the census of 1960, those additional two seats went away, and this 435-seat um, um, House was dispersed now um, over these two new states as well. The Constitution states that there shall be a census every 10 years and that after that census, states that gained significant population since the last census were entitled to receive more seats in the House. 435 was a static number, so those new seats had to come from somewhere. And they, of course, have come from states that have lost significant population since the last census. Now, many of you who are watching this presentation probably live somewhere in the Sun Belt, maybe in Texas, maybe in Florida. Some of you stale may be up in the um, mid-Atlantic. But we've seen, at least since 1950, but certainly by 1960, 
a great transmigration occur within the United States, whereby states that had much larger populations relative to the rest of the country, and thus many more seats in the House because of that population, has seen every 10 years their number of House seats drop as states like California, Texas, Florida, but now Arizona, Georgia, North Carolina have been beneficiaries of lots of people leaving the Northeast and the industrial Midwest to make their way to the South. And only through the census, this is a census year in, in 2020, um, this electoral college map, which we'll explain in a while, won't be useful um, in the election of 2024 because we know that following this year's census, there are going to be a redistribution of seats in some states. We believe, based on projections, for instance, that Texas is going to get three additional seats in the House of Representatives, Florida probably two, and states like Georgia, Arizona, Colorado, Montana are going to gain one. Now, those eight or nine seats have to come from somewhere, and they're primarily going to come from states like New York, Illinois, Indiana, Iowa, Michigan, Pennsylvania, um, Minnesota, who are projected probably to lose one seat each, and for the very first time in American history, California is projected to lose a House seat. It's thought that every day about a million Californians leave their state, most of them heading to Texas. Texas might want to consider building a wall along its northern border and its western border because of this rush of Californians making their way there. And Alabama, a state that has seen as an anomaly in the South a drop in population, may lose a seat as well. We'll talk about that next year when the results of the census come out. Now in the Senate, it was easy. Two seats per state irrespective of population. Population does not matter. Now, because senators represented the state as an entity as a whole, both senators represented the entirety of their state, and for maybe some other self-protective reasons, the Constitution as written did not call for the direct election of senators by citizens living in the states, but rather until the ratification of the 17th Amendment in 1913, senators were not elected but selected by the legislatures of the states from which they came. Again, sort of giving each state as a whole, two members in this upper house, as senators like to think of themselves as uh, these days, and only beginning with the elections of 1914, were United States senators, like House members always have been, directly elected by citizens living in their states. There are 50 states, so we know that there are today 100 um, United States senators. Now, the Constitution created, of course, the office of President of the United States, among other things, directed that he be the country's chief executive, the person responsible for overseeing the running of the government on a day-to-day -day basis. And, of course, we know that there were some special requirements 
that only the person that held the office of president and president alone would have to meet. He would have to be 35 years old in the 1780s, a man firmly, wisely in his middle age. He would have to be a, quote, natural born citizen of the United States. We've dwelled on this before. Today, if you are born in the United States, irrespective of your parent status as citizens or resident aliens, or if they're here illegally, because of the 14th Amendment, if you are born on American soil, you are a natural born American citizen eligible to hold the office of President of the United States. We went through that with Barack Obama in 2008. There's been some noise about Kamala Harris not being eligible to be president. She was born in Oakland, California. So just like Florida's Marco Rubio, who was born in Florida to parents who at the time of his birth were permanent resident aliens, not citizens, Kamala Harris, like Rubio, of course, is constitutionally eligible to be president of the United States. The president was given, of course, a number of powers and duties. Chief executive, commander in chief of the military in time of war, um, our nation's chief diplomat, able to make treaties with the advice and consent of the Senate. And of course, the president begins the process of filling vacancies, appointive powers in many federal offices. Any vacancy in the federal judiciary, he appoints members to a presidential cabinet, he appoints commissioners to um, federal agencies, and the president has the power to um, appoint ambassadors and ministers to represent our country abroad. A sticking point came when the question arose as to how the president was going to be elected. Some delegates very almost reflexively said, that's easy. Let all the votes be cast, add them all up, and whoever receives the most votes nationwide becomes the president. There were some problems with this initially. Ironically, one was at a time before the telegraph and the telephone, when news and information traveled very slowly, adding the national popular vote, and then getting it to one central location, the nation's capital, might take a long time, maybe several weeks. And there was a belief that the election of a president should be done perhaps more immediately, more quickly. There was a concern, again, by residents of less populous states that if you just used the national popular vote, what was to stop Virginia, Massachusetts, New York, Pennsylvania from getting together, forming some type of cabal, and every four years electing a favorite son from one of those states, sort of monopolizing the president, presidency, making it difficult for citizens from less populous states to rise to that office. But again, there was another reason that the framers didn't like counting the national popular vote. And it had to do with the fact that the men who wrote the Constitution, again, were worldly, well-read, highly literate, highly educated, people of means. And they very much wondered what would happen if some demagogue someone in the thrall of a foreign country were to come along and, and for lack of a better word, bamboozle the common voter into voting for them, might the nation not suffer because the lack of, at the time, a less seasoned, less proficient, less literate electorate 
So they believed for many reasons that there had to be a different system to elect our president. It's an indirect system, or at least it was certainly um, intended to be. And again, it was this system that was given the name the Electoral College. Now, the Electoral College was created utilizing the compromise that had been reached to create two houses in Congress. And someone said, wait a minute, why don't we use as a template the way in which houses, house seats are apportioned between the states after a census based on population and the fact that every state has two seats in the Senate based on no population, every state has the same, as a way to create a system to elect our president. And that exactly, that math is exactly the system that we use today. Currently, of course, there are 435 members of the House distributed among the 50 states. There are 100 senators. And since 1961, when states amended the Constitution to give residents of Washington, D.C., actual votes for the president. The amendment said District of Columbia will have the same number of electoral votes as the smallest state shall have, which is three. DC has had three electoral votes come presidential election time, even though they do not have voting members in the House or the Senate. That could have only been done through the amendment process. So you add them all together and the number comes out 538. That is the total number of electoral votes if you were to add up all the numbers on this map. Trust me, they come up to 538. The Constitution says that in order to be elected president, a candidate has to win not a plurality, but a majority, 50% plus one of this total number, thus creating in modern American presidential politics 270 as the magic number that a candidate must win in order to be elected president of um, the, the United States. Now, here is a map that since the 2012 election and the 2016 election and the 2020 election that reflects how many electoral votes each state has. Keep in mind and bear in mind that after the census of this year is completed, this map will be stored away in, in the dustbin of presidential history because see, states that gain additional seats in the House, by virtue of this formula, are going to gain additional electoral votes. Now you look at this map, and it tells us a lot. If you look, for instance, at Montana, three electoral votes. California, the largest, 55. Um, Texas, 38. Illinois, 20. Ohio, 18. You can determine from this electoral vote map 
if you subtract two from any of these numbers, two being the senators that each state has in the Senate, you subtract two from any of the states in this map, and you should have the map in front of you as well, you take away two, and that tells you the number of seats that a state has in the House of Representatives. So California, 55 minus two, 53 seats in the House. That may go down one after the census, so California's electoral vote total uh, come 2024 likely will be 54. Look at Texas, 38 electoral votes, take away two, 36 seats in the House. Texas is expected to get three more House seats following the census, so they will have 39 House seats plus their two electoral votes, they will be up to um, 41 electoral votes. If Florida gains an additional House seat as expected, Florida will have 28 House seats, not 27 as we do now, and 30 electoral votes, 29. And again, we see New York probably is going to see its House seat total and thus its electoral vote total tick down, 28. Pennsylvania might end up with 19 come 2024. Ohio 17, Indiana 10, Illinois 19, Wisconsin maybe 9, Michigan 15. As a consequence of the loss of population in these states since the census of 2010. So you look at the map as it sits today, subtract 2 for the number of senators, and that tells you the number of seats your state has in the House of Representatives. Bear in mind, of course, that there are some states whose populations are so small that they have only one seat in the House. You know, the great anomalies. Two senators, because every state has two senators, but in places like Delaware, in places like Alaska, the Dakotas. Why are there two Dakotas, by the way? That's for another day. Montana, Wyoming, the most uh, sparsely populated states in the country, they only have one House seat. It's called an at-large House member. One person represents all of Alaska in the House. One represents each of the Dakotas and Wyoming and Montana in the House. But because every state has two senators, their two senators give them three electoral votes. Now, what does that mean? That means that in many cases, depending on your view of the Electoral College, these states are greatly overrepresented in getting to determine who becomes president. Here's an example. Wyoming is the least populous state in the country. About 580,000 people live in this big state. Divide that number, 580, by their three electoral votes, and Wyoming gets one electoral vote for every 193,000 Wyomians. One for every, again, one electoral vote out of three for every 190,000 people living in Wyoming. Now look at California, 55 electoral votes. That's a huge number. California's population is almost 40 million, a greater population than Canada. So you divide 55 into 40 million, and that works out to California having one electoral vote for every 727,000 Californians. One California House, one California House district on average 
has more residents than, than the entire state of Wyoming. If you were to give California one electoral vote for every 193,000 Californians like you do in Wyoming, California would have 207 electoral votes. Texas, 29 million people now live in, in the Lone Star State, meaning that its 38 electoral votes um, deliver, mean that there is one electoral vote for every 763,000 Texans. Again, each electoral vote represents more than the population of Wyoming. If Texas was given one electoral vote um, based on the Wyoming number, 190,000, Texas would have 150 electoral votes. Florida would have 108. So this discrepancy, if that's the right word, is one of the current great criticisms that even though many of these states look to have just few numbers of electoral votes, they are really relative to larger states overrepresented because they've got two senators just like every other state and the Constitution says every state has to have at least one seat in the House. One plus two uh, gives us those three um, electoral votes. Now, um, the Constitution gives every state the ability to determine how those electoral votes are going to be won come presidential election time. And with two exceptions, and we'll talk about them in a minute, Nebraska and Maine Every other state awards their electoral votes on a winner-take-all basis. The candidate who wins the most votes cast in a presidential election in every state but Nebraska and Maine, not a majority, who gets more votes in that state than any other candidate, wins all of that state's predetermined number of electoral votes. If you win by a landslide or you win by a very small margin, the prize is the same, all of them. Um, those of you living down in Florida, those of you living down in South Florida, remember in 2000, uh, Bush v. Gore, that when George Bush was determined to have won the vote cast in Florida by about 500 votes over Al Gore, he won all of Florida's 25 electoral votes and thus won the presidency. In 2000, and we'll talk about that in, in, our, um, in our November lecture, when every state except Florida was counted, Al Gore had 267 electoral votes. George Bush had 246. So that no candidate had 270, the winner would come down to who eventually won at the time, this was two censuses ago, Florida's then 25 electoral votes. Now remember, Al Gore from Tennessee didn't win his home state. You know, a measly 11 electoral votes, he'd have been over the top he'd have been president. Al Gore didn't win Bill Clinton's home state of Arkansas. Six electoral votes. What does that matter? 
Six would have put him over the top. Florida wouldn't have mattered. So when all the dust settled and the Supreme Court, for the first time in American history, intervened in a significant way in a presidential election, Bush was declared the winner, and thus with 271 electoral votes, one more than needed to consist or to constitute a majority, became president of the United States. States like winner take all, because if you're a state like Florida, the biggest of all battleground states at the present time, Texas, if you haven't checked, is becoming more and more and more of a highly um, contested state. Florida loves the fact that for the last five or six presidential election cycles, more money is spent advertising in Florida, more candidate time and time for surrogates and advertising in Miami and Naples and Tampa and Orlando and Jacksonville and Tallahassee is spent in Florida. So for instance, if Florida awarded its electoral vote on a proportional basis, you win 50% of the popular vote, you get 50% of the electoral votes, we'd probably see a lot of close 15, 14, 16, 13, who cares and who would spend a lot of time if the prize wasn't all of it, winner take all. So winner take all is the norm, state by state by state by state. And again, I promise we will get to how Nebraska and Maine do things, because if any state wanted to, if its legislature voted to do so, and the governor signed the bill, they could change the way in which these electoral votes are won because as a product of the federal system of governing um, um, created, the Constitution gives not to Congress, but to each state legislature, the ability to determine how their electors are, are, are selected. Now, in recent times, we know that lots of states vote the same way, certainly in recent elections, time after time after time. We know that on the basis of demographics, we know on the basis of geographical um, location, we know on the basis of polling, how a lot of states, barring something highly unusual on November the 3rd, we know how they're going to vote. The candidates know that there are certain states that they are surely going to win, and they know, and again, it's based again on polling, on demographic, on recent voting trends, they know there are certain states that they're surely going to lose. So there's not a lot of logic in spending a lot of money in a state that all these factors pretty much tell you you're going to win, nor does it make any sense at all to dump a lot of money into a state that again, by habit, by demographics, by polling, by recent electoral behavior, you know you're not going to win. So with this in mind, we can now put up our very own 2020 Electoral College map. Those states that are blue are states that as we stand here today um, on the 18th of August, Joe Biden has a more than 10 percentage point lead over President Trump at the state level. Those states that are red are likewise states that have at least a 10% polling lead for President Trump. 
Remember the websites, 538.com and realclearpolitics.com. If you like following this stuff, you can have a statistical nerd fest watching every day as the numbers change, as these two sites collect, they aggregate, and then average state polling results only from polling entities that they deem to have a statistically reliable model in going out and testing the, the electorate. So as we stand here today, these red states, I suggest, are places where President Trump doesn't have to spend a whole lot of time getting people that are going to vote for him to vote for him. And I suspect the Biden campaign isn't going to spend a lot of money in any of these states. On the other hand, we look at the blue states and we see, of course, in Washington and Oregon and California, um, Joe Biden has very large leads in those states. Um, the Northeast, of course, has always been a fertile ground for Democrats in recent presidential elections. And thus, New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Delaware, Rhode Island, Vermont, New Hampshire has gone Republican in the recent past, but Biden has at this point a significant lead there. And mid-Atlantic states, um, Virginia has suddenly become a reliably blue state, Biden enjoying a 13-point lead. Um, in the Old Dominion, uh, as, as um, um, Virginia is known. So we take this all away and recognize that the green states are the battleground states, the states where the polls are too close, the certainty of predicting any victory far, far difficult to, to um, calculate. And there are currently in states that I've deemed to be undecided, again, a less than 10 point margin between the candidates, states whose electoral vote count total 207 in, in toto. So these are the places, and of course, we have historical battleground states. For the last 40 years, Florida, Ohio, Iowa, um, Colorado at one time, Nevada, New Hampshire, battleground states. We've got some that are sort of coming onto the map as battleground states. States, again, that were formerly uh, reliably Republican. Arizona, Barry Goldwater's home state. Texas, again, both Arizona, Texas, and Georgia experiencing this huge influx of people coming from outside the state to live in their states have now become states that are too close to call. Um, until the election of 2016, many would have put Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin into the blue column because prior to 2016, no Republican had carried either of the, any of these states, Pennsylvania, Michigan, or Wisconsin since 1992. 28 years ago, an eternity in, in presidential elections, it turns out that Donald Trump won all three of them, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, by a total of 70,000 votes out of 17 million that were cast, and thus he won all 46 of these electoral votes, 
that put him over the top in a 306 to 232 electoral college margin of victory. Had he not won those three, had Hillary Clinton held the blue wall, Trump would have been at 260, Hillary Clinton would have been at uh, 278, and she would have been president of the United States. So we are watching as in Pennsylvania, Milwaukee, uh, Michigan, Wisconsin, in Minnesota, a blue state where the margin between the president and Joe Biden has narrowed, in Iowa, a place that President Trump won easily four years ago, like he did in, in Ohio, the margins are closing. Missouri is a battleground state that I had to label a battleground state because right now the polling indicates there's only a five and a half point margin between the president and Joe Biden. I suspect Missouri is going to break for President Trump as it's become a fairly reliable red state. But in, in following this um, protocol, we have to list it as it is. The next lecture will have a new map and, and we'll have some of these states maybe a more clarified. North Carolina, a battleground state. Barack Obama won North Carolina in 2008, the first time a Democrat had won since 1976. The polling numbers very close there. Florida, of course, very close as, as, as always. Um, and um, Nevada and, and Arizona, again, states that are, are very close to um, um, discern. Now, as we sit here today, just in order to give us an idea of how close these battleground states might be, um, Georgia, 16 electoral votes, one of the faster growing states in the country. The margin between President Trump and Joe Biden in many months of averages of state polls, President Trump has a 0.9% lead over Joe Biden, less than one percentage point. In Iowa, six electoral votes, the president's margin over Joe Biden, 1.4%. In Texas, two polls in the last two days have come out showing the president um, with a lead over Joe Biden. The president now has a 2 percentage point lead over Joe Biden. When in the world have we seen Texas that close? And in Missouri, again, a state I suspect to break for the president, the president's lead over Joe Biden is just 5.5%. Now, on the other hand, in the green states, the battleground states, where Joe Biden is at least leading as we stand here today, Arizona, a previously reliably red state, um, Vice President Biden has a three and a half point lead over President Trump. Remember, Arizona is also um, running a very t closely watched Senate race where the Democratic nominee, the former astronaut Mark Kelly, married to former Congresswoman Gabby Giffords, is taking on Martha McSally, a Republican who currently occupies that Arizona Senate seat. Biden up three and a half points. In Florida, the president's new home state, the president calling himself a favorite son, of, of the Sunshine State. The aggregate average of the polls shows the president ahead, uh, I'm sorry, shows Biden ahead of the president by 5.3 percentage points. Um, the, the upper Midwest, these um, green states that once upon a time were, were blue. In Pennsylvania, Biden has a six and a half point lead in the average of polls, um, a 0.5% lead over the president in Ohio, less than one percentage point. Biden's lead in Michigan, 
percent. Again, as we stand here today, um, in Wisconsin, um, 6.7 percent lead for Biden over the president. In Minnesota, five and a half point lead um, for Congressman uh, for Vice President Biden. And again, in Pennsylvania, six and a half points. Nevada, a, a, a swingy state of sorts, um, finds Biden with a 6.7% uh, um, lead. So how these states break, and again, right now we've got 75 days to go. When you watch this, we'll be uh, 60 days or so away, an eternity in politics. Now, Maine and Nebraska, what are these green dots? if you are watching this closely, in red Nebraska and blue Maine? And the answer is that in the mid-2000s, both Nebraska and Maine decided that they were going to change the way in which their electoral votes were won. We know that each state, Nebraska has five electoral votes, Maine has four. Two of those electoral votes come for the two senators that each of those state possesses. The remaining electoral votes comes from the three House seats that exist in Nebraska and the two House seats that um, are located in Maine. So come election day, the candidate who wins the most votes statewide in Maine and Nebraska will win two of their electoral votes, representing the two statewide senators that each state has. But in Nebraska, the candidate who wins the most votes in each of the three congressional district will win the one electoral vote awarded to that state for each of its three um, electoral uh, congressional districts. And it so happens that the district in Nebraska, where its largest city, Omaha, is located, is right now too close to call. So if the president were to win four out of five seats in Nebraska, Obama did the same in 2008. That, of course, wouldn't be um, shocking, but it would be abnormal because you can't split the electoral vote in any other state. And in Maine, um, Joe Biden is leading in the polling in the overall vote in Maine. He's far ahead on Maine's first congressional district, the lower one, closer to um, New Hampshire, but Maine's second congressional district, which President Trump won four years ago, is once again too close to call. Now, I'm going to wrap this up by explaining that the November the 3rd is not the end of the process of electing our president. And for most of our history, what has followed has been mechanistic, routine, anticlimactic matters. Because according to the Constitution and dates set by Congress, once we know who has won every one of these electoral votes, we will, and I'm, I'm not making this up by the way, on the Monday following the second Wednesday in December, December 14th, witness the so-called meeting of electors. Um, when we go and vote for president, we are actually voting for a slate of electors that have been chosen to be the electors of either President Trump 
or Joe Biden, depending on which of them happens to win that state. So in states that, and, and prior to the election, for instance, in Florida, the Republicans and Democrats by election day will have selected 29 Trump delegates, 29 Biden delegates, that it will be their electors in the event they win. Texas, there'll be 38 Trump electors, there'll be 38 Biden electors, three of each in, in North Dakota, 55 in California, 13 in Virginia. Trump electors, Biden electors, and depending on who wins, those 13 individuals on December the 14th, the Monday following the second Wednesday in December, will go to their state capitals and symbolically, that's what it used to be, cast those votes for the candidate who won the state. So the electoral votes that were won on election day will be formally cast state by state by state on that date in December. And then come January 6th, the outgoing Congress will meet in a joint session to vote to approve and accept the vote of the electors based on the vote of the populace. And on January 6th of next year, 2021, whoever won the race will be declared by a joint session of Congress to have formally and finally been elected president of the United States, unless there are delays in votes being counted, unless there are challenges to claims that one candidate won a state where the other believes he might not have. Um, scenarios of state legislatures, which are controlled usually by one party or the other, becoming involved, have created not uncertainty, not chaos, but a possibility that after the voting takes place on November the 3rd, but in the 41 days before the electors meet in their state capitals, and then 23 days after that, on January the 6th, when Congress ends the process, we may see a lot of noise, we may see a lot of litigation, um, we may see, again, this, this mail-in voting um, issue emerge, not on the campaign trail, but in front of state legislatures, and maybe even in a, a courtroom or two. So please look at your handouts. There is an electoral college um, prediction sheet on that one. We'll have another one in the October handout as well. Um, hopefully your communities are gonna permit you to submit a prediction on how the electoral vote will turn out. You could look at them afterwards, Hopefully when we meet then we'll be able to identify the winners in community after community. But we are now in the nitty gritty. We are now in the final sprint. And I hope everyone is doing better. I hope your states are doing better. It appears that most of them are. And hopefully that will enable us sooner rather than later, hopefully close to the election, to get together and assess what is happening in real time. So as always, thank you for joining us and um, stay safe, wear your mask, socially distance and all that other good stuff. And we'll see you again in October. Take care.